But again, we are seeing, we're certainly seeing some rebalancing away from consumer spending. We will see quite a lot of rebalancing away from government in favour of investment and trade. Uh, and that's, you know, that is still the, the, the aim, the story of the, uh, of the, the, the way the economy goes. Um, productivity, you know, one of the great puzzles about, one of, you know, one of the good things that has happened about the economy over recent years, and uh, James and I were talking about this, was, the, was the, the fact that employment has held up a lot better than expected, unemployment went up a lot less than expected. So, you know, the contrast I always draw is between now and the early 90s. In the early 90s, the, um, uh, the economy shrank by, uh, it felt worse at the time, but the economy shrank by 2.5%, but employment fell by 6.5%. This time, we had, uh, in 2008-9 recession, we had uh, an economy that shrank by 7%, so a much worse recession, uh, but employment only, only fell by 2.5%, so almost a mirror image. And until very recently, um, until the latest three months, employment was holding up very well, and unemployment had gone up a lot less than people expected. But the price we've had to pay for that is, has been weak productivity. So uh, output per worker, you know, maybe it is because more employers have been hanging on to labor, you know, hanging on to people rather than uh, getting rid of them when the downturn happened in the anticipation of recovery and stronger recovery. So one slight concern is how this, how this situation uh, resolves itself. You know, will it be that productivity comes back but at the, at the expense of employment, uh, will we see much weaker employment than we've got at the moment? And, you know, if one looks at the, um, the projections for uh, employment, again, that we had, uh, unemployment that we had yesterday, um, they do assume a further increase in unemployment over the next couple of years before it starts to head down again. The, the picture for... Um, uh, employment presented yesterday was not as gloomy as you might think. I mean, I think everybody has picked up on the, uh, you know, the new forecast, the, the new more gloomy forecast for public sector employment, which is that there will be uh, a total of 710,000 public sector job losses by uh, 2017. Uh, however, you know, even within this, uh, it is assumed there will be a net increase in employment in the economy, that, um, that there will be uh, over this period uh, even a period of somewhat weaker growth than we thought before, there will be 1.7 million private sector jobs uh, created, giving a net increase in employment of a million. So it's not as bad when you look at the broader picture. And that, you know, it sounds terribly optimistic, but that was the experience of the, uh, of the 1990s. You know, we saw in that period seven to 800,000 uh, uh, public sector jobs being cut, but, uh, but in net terms, more than a million uh, uh, jobs being created because of the private sector. So it is not pie in the sky to talk about that, but at the moment, you know, we're in an interesting situation where obviously confidence is quite weak and, uh, and that, that confidence, that uncertainty may extend itself to, uh, to employment decisions. So, so there is a concern there. As I say, you look at the, uh, what happened to unemployment, it went up a lot as the recession hit initially, but then has been pretty flat over the past couple of years. Uh, and in the case of the claimant count was falling, and then it suddenly, you know, it, suddenly it's, it started to rise again. So that is the, that is the fear uh, that maybe, you know, in, some employers have got fed up of waiting for the, uh, for the strength of the upturn that they expected. Um, what about the, uh, the growth measures that we had yesterday? I mean, there were quite a lot of those. I think the uh, the reason you, you, know, you can see in the, um, in the strategy that, uh, that George Osborne and, and his advisors had was that you know, they clearly thought that the, yesterday was going to be all about gloom on growth and gloom on the public finances. So as I say, and I'm very grateful, you know, a lot of the other measures were, um, uh, were dribbled out in advance. And, um, and that gives us something to write about the Sunday before, which is always a, a problem weekend. Um, and there were things there. So, you know, in the case of um, uh, SMEs uh, and this, uh, this, uh, this credit easing package, uh, I think this is a good thing. I mean, I think the, you know, the, um, uh, I would like to have seen the, um, uh, the Bank of England more directly involved in, um, in credit easing, uh, because I, you know, uh, as you will know, you know, the Bank of England has been doing something slightly, you know, sort of, well, very different called quantitative easing, 
Um, but it could have, um, it could have purchased uh, assets that would have included bundles of, uh, of SME loans, and that would have helped free up um, the, uh, the market for, uh, for loans to small businesses. Uh, but the governor uh, refused to do that. He said you know, he didn't want that risk on the, uh, on the bank's balance sheet. So what you've had instead is the, you know, the Treasury having to find another way around this and uh, they, they, this National Loan Guarantee Scheme, which is aimed to, at increasing the supply and reducing the cost of lending to SMEs. I think it's quite important that, uh, that this works because um, you know, bank lending to SMEs has been falling at a, around about a 5 to 6% annual rate since the uh, early part of 2009 and shows no sign, despite you know, Project Merlin and anything like that, and the, People from the banks may have a different view on this, but it shows no real sign of, um, of picking up. And that's partly because, um, you know, the banks themselves have, uh, have uh, issues and pressures and regulatory constraints, but also because, you know, if you think of what the, the, you know, the small business lending market before the crisis, uh, we've lost a lot of players. I mean, the Irish banks were quite big players in the SME market. They're, they're not there anymore, uh, as well as some others. So, um, so I think this is quite, quite useful. Um, and a whole string of things, uh, uh, you know, I don't know whether people can read this, but I think some of these things which will, I mean, we, we get very cynical about, you know, changes in employment legislation. Will they, uh, will they have an impact or is this just more... Uh, another sort of bonfire of controls, which doesn't really um, uh, get, uh, uh, you know, really, really take take light. Um, uh, but I think, you know, there's there, certainly the government is uh, is showing willing on quite a lot of these things, and I think they are aware that the, you know, the burden of employment legislation has um, has not only become too large for some employers, but um, but you know, abuse of the uh, industrial tribunal process, uh, the you know, very uh, onerous uh, dismissal procedures. Um, if they get half the way along some of these, I think it will be a welcome easing of some of the uh, some of the burdens of employment. Uh, quite important that um, you know they're looking at uh, they've asked the pay review bodies to look at uh, the issue of public sector pay. Should we have you know at the moment it is mainly a question of having you know, national levels of public sector pay with uh, individual exceptions like London waiting. The aim here is to look much, uh, much more at local labour markets. And it's as much to prevent, uh, you know, the, the, the Treasury is, is emphasising this is not just about saving money. It's, and it, it's not mainly about saving money. But quite often, I think what they've encountered is that private sector employers in some areas have found that they themselves have difficulty because of the competition from the public sector. Now, obviously, less of an issue when the public sector is cutting back, but quite important. This seed in enterprise investment scheme, quite interesting, you know, and, uh, and a couple of other things here. Manufacturing seems to quite like the uh, R&D tax credit shake-up, um, which, I, which it thinks will make a difference. So, again, some, you know, some useful bits and pieces. Um, you know, people will have... Uh, different views compared with what bit of the economy they're in. Um, and, of course, the famous uh, infrastructure package. Uh, and, again, I was quite pleased with this because I have been arguing for some time that um, there was scope for uh, switching some uh, current spending into capital spending. Capital spending um, generates more jobs, creates a, you know, a long-term uh, asset that, uh, that, you can, uh, uh, that is, is obviously helpful for the country's uh, productive potential. And so it's good to see that that has happened. It's not huge amounts of money, you know, five billion over three years, followed by another five billion over the next three years is, is not much more than small change when it comes to the public finances, but will make a difference. And I think they've, they've talked about the kind of projects. This has a lot of potential as well, though, I think, using institutional money. I mean, it's the great holy grail of using, getting inst institutional money into infrastructure projects in a way that uh, you know, gives a return to the institutions. Um, and you know, uh, and the, the, the model here is, uh, is you know, the Canadian uh, Teachers' Pension Fund is one example which has which is, uh, invested heavily. Obviously, sovereign wealth funds as well. Um, and 
you know, how the, I think the issue here is how you, uh, how you establish the, uh, the return. I mean, I think for, you know, for good and bad reasons, PFI has fallen into disrepute because, you know, it was thought that the, the contracts that were signed were just too generous to the private financiers of those schemes. Um, does it mean when you set up infrastructure projects like this, you have to have an identified stream of income, say, in the case of roads from tolls and so on? But it's an interesting challenge. And I think this has enormous potential using institutional money for, to fund infrastructure projects. Um, not least because, you know, if you think about the initial aim of the PFI, it was to get these things done more efficiently, delivered on time and so on. Um, and, you know, whatever one thinks of government, you know, its record on big projects is not often that good. So if you've got the institutions who are able to bring pressure to bear for these things to be delivered efficiently, I think that is, that is a good thing. So quite a few positives there. Uh, but, you know, the overall message of the, um, of the autumn statement is that growth prospects are certainly weaker than they were. You've got these public sector job losses and, you know, a continued squeeze on the public sector in terms of pay. I think, you know, that there, there will be, you know, obviously we've got the day of action today or inaction today and there will be many more of those, I think. You know, there will be um, the public sector is, uh, is in for a prolonged squeeze, both in terms of employment and in terms of, uh, of pay. And if you remember, um, you know, in the in what seems like the dim and distant past, when, when, when George Osborne first announced the squeeze on public sector pay, uh, which I think he did uh, in his, at his last party conference before the, um, before the election, it was seen as an alternative to big public sector job cuts. You know, that if, uh, if the public sector was responsible on pay, you wouldn't have to have uh, such large cuts in public sector employment. The fact is we're getting both. And I think it does become, become interesting, you know, it ca can... You know, George Osborne can't really afford another uh, occasion uh, such as yesterday uh, because, you know, the fiscal rules are pretty close to being broken already. Um, if they come any close to being broken, then it could be that, you know, it won't be enough merely to say we'll control public spending, we'll cut public spending in the early years of the next parliament. It could be that the, to meet the rules, uh, the Office of Budget Responsibility would say we have to do something before that, and I think that gets very, very di difficult. Um, and, you know, the AAA rating could come under threat. I think, you know, my view is that if, if Britain lost the AAA rating, uh, George Osborne could not continue as Chancellor because I think it would, it would you know, such store has been set by maintaining that, uh, that, uh, that it would be a considerable defeat, and how itchy will the Lib Dems get with the austerity?